Okay, welcome back. So I had this connection problem and we are back. So I was just explaining how we approach the um, correct solution. So at the first step, when the continuation value is zero, right? We consume all of it. So you may imagine this as one over one, right? So the, the saving is zero. So the marginal propensity to consume is exactly one. Now in the second step, we find this solution. Again, this solution is not correct because we know the correct solution. Correct solution, as we found last week, is this, right? So then in the, in the next step, so the, each of these are iterations, okay? Uh, then I realize the pattern, okay? So this pattern goes on like this. So since alpha beta is less than one, this, this sum converges to this. Okay, so then only if uh, only if j goes to positive infinity, I can find the true solution. Okay, this one. But numerically, numerically, of course, you're gonna look at this distance again. This norm. As long as it is very small, it is less than this norm being less than some tolerance level, which is typically a number such as this, okay? Very small number. Then you stop, then you say, okay, that's good enough. All right, because that's only an approximation. Now the problem uh, with the value function iteration is that it is typically slow, all right? But policy function iteration, which is also a projection-based method, is relatively faster, okay? So here, once again, we have the Bellman function written as a mapping, okay? Again, I am using the same example and I write this in this way as a mapping, okay? Now here, uh, we're gonna guess the policy functions, okay? So here, uh, what we are gonna use is this, okay? I'm gonna use uh, a policy function guess, Okay, and then similarly, I will have a policy function guess for the saving, all right? So step one again is starting with such guesses, okay? So let's suppose that uh, in the first iterate, in the first iterate, I have this. So we see uh, we see lambda kt alpha and kt plus one zero, okay, is omega. So this is omega, omega k lambda kt alpha. Obviously, I want these to be less than one, and I want them to be sum to one, okay? Now, step two is to calculate Vj uh, kt, okay? So we want to calculate this. So how do we do that? Well, here is the idea. So I know if that's a solution, it must satisfy this, right? Beta t, natural logarithm of ct. In other words, you have ln c0, beta ln c1, 
uh, beta square and then C2, right? And that goes on. Now, what you have is, okay, so you have ln uh, omega C lambda K zero alpha, right? Then beta ln, the same policy function as you see, K one alpha, right? Then you have beta square and then omega C lambda K two alpha, and that goes on, okay? So you have uh, what? Now you have VC lambda, right? Times from t equals zero to positive infinity, uh, beta t, right? If you look at this carefully, here these terms, these terms are common in all of them, right? So I can separate them out. Then what do I have? I have uh, and then uh, K zero alpha plus beta ln k1 alpha beta square and then k2 alpha and that goes on all right so um i can actually write this in this way so this this part is now this right and this part can be written in this way so um, and then k0 alpha beta. Now I'm going to replace k1. So what is k1 equal to? Remember, k1 will be equal to uh, omega k lambda k0 alpha, right? So k2 will be equal to omega k lambda k1 alpha. So it will be omega k lambda uh, times omega k lambda k zero alpha uh, to the alpha, okay? So uh, I will have for k one, I have vk lambda uh, k zero alpha. And for b two, I will have, um, Okay, nice. Uh, VK lambda, careful. I have one plus alpha and I have K zero alpha square. Okay. Plus dot dot dot. Okay. Now from, from this, you're gonna also realize there's a pattern. Okay. Uh, and at the end, at the end, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving this, you know, seeing this pattern as an exercise, but eventually you're gonna see something like this, okay? So eventually uh, you're gonna have um, a double sum like this, okay? Uh, so um, it will be like beta t times uh, sum from s equals zero to t um, alpha s or something like that, okay? And that will converge to a constant, okay? But it doesn't really matter because obviously you're gonna do that numerically. The idea is this, once you calculate V, Okay, you're gonna find a bunch of constants depending on alpha, beta, lambda, okay? And then you're gonna find another constant, let's say omega, alpha, beta, lambda, okay? Times ln k, all right? Now you have a value function again. 
Okay, so those are those are going to be known, and you have a value function once again thanks to the logarithmic term. It will be a very simple term, and now you can find c1 t. Okay. Uh, Uh, as a function of, I mean, I'm not going to do that. But then, now you have a new policy function in the second step. Okay, so this function is now different. Okay. Um, of course, that also depends on, uh, sorry, so I must be careful. So these are generally, generally depend on, um, okay. These are generally depend on omega C, omega K as well, okay? But it doesn't really matter. If you have a solution already, I mean, if, you, if this problem will have a solution, then that has to work as long as your Bellman equation is a contraction mapping, okay? So in the next iterate, once again, you will have a policy function, okay? So we start with, with this policy function in the first step, okay? C0 equals omega C lambda KT alpha and K0 is omega K lambda kt alpha now these functions will be different okay because these functions now depend on these parameters okay and they will be different then once again of course you can calculate v1k all right then you're gonna find c2 and k2 okay then you're gonna have v2 right then you're gonna calculate c3 k3 then you're gonna have v3 okay and that goes on until when until once again there is a stopping criteria now now you're gonna look at the policy functions okay you're gonna look at this difference because you are iterating over the policy functions, okay? That's the notion. That's, that's the idea. But now, uh, this is faster, right? This must be faster. Can you explain why? Can you explain why, why policy function iteration must be faster than value function iteration? I'm asking you. So the idea is this, in the value function iteration, you want to calculate all possible values of the uh, value function. Okay, for any k, for any k in this state space, okay, you calculate the value function at each iteration. Okay, now here you can only do it for the policy function, all right? So you can calculate the value function only for the, uh, only for one policy. In the case of value function iteration, since you do not know what policy function you have, you have to calculate it for each and every possible policy function, okay? For, for each and every value of C and K plus one, okay? CT and KT plus one. In the policy function iteration, you are already assuming that there is a policy that the decision maker uh, always implement for the rest of the history, right? So you calculate the value function only once. On, on, I mean, only for one policy function. So it is 
considerably faster. Okay. Now, what I want to do now, if you do, you have any questions or anything I can clear up? Uh, anything I can re-explain? So I think I, I I give you the general idea of these iterations. All right. So um, obviously, in such simple models, we don't need them. But once the model gets complicated and once the model becomes stochastic, actually, uh, we're gonna see them uh, next week. Uh, once the model gets more complicated and the model becomes stochastic model, then uh, we need we need to use such such techniques. All right, and we need to we need to uh, we need computer power there. All right, we need we need we need computing power there. So. Um, Critically, of course, that all depends on how, how fast your processor is, how, how, how large your uh, memory is, et cetera, okay? Uh, it would be a great thing if you have multiple cores in your processor. Uh, so there are usually supercomputers in university uh, campuses. I mean, um, well, we had this system back in UNC so uh, there are supercomputers in the in the laboratory or somewhere in the campus. So you can you can connect to these computers, and you can run uh, your codes in those computers. Then you you receive the results. So uh, so more computing power is necessary, especially uh, especially if you have many state variables. All right, with one state variable, it is pretty easy because it will be just one vector. Okay, with two state variables, it will be a two-dimensional two space, right? Uh, it will not be a vector, it will be a matrix. And if you have, let's say, six state variables, then it will take a lot of time, for instance, okay? All right, now let me, let me now uh, give you some hints about the numerical application of such methods, okay? I will be very brief and the discussion will be informal, but just to give you the sense of what is really going on, all right? So here in this simple problem with, uh, let me just once again write the Bellman equation, uh, we have a very simple logarithmic utility function and uh, the continuation value, uh, we have the constraint satisfying this, right? So we have alpha beta between zero and one uh, and lambda greater than zero, right? So obviously in the model, KT is a real variable, right? So there is an initial value and if capital is gonna grow, uh, let's say there's the possibility of infinite growth, you can have like this, but in general, KT is a real variable, which is not negative, okay? Now a computer cannot, cannot work with real numbers, right? Because in computer, it has to be, it has to be discrete. So you must create a grid, okay? A grid is something like this. So this is, let's say, KT, and this is real line, okay? This is zero. Now, uh, if the computer cannot understand real numbers because there's an infinite number of uh, real numbers, right? Even in a, even in a closed interval, you have to create discrete points of K. Equally spaced, of course. Now this is, this will be K1, K2, K3, K4, K5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and let's say 10. Okay, now these are not time, right? These are just, ordered values of 
uh, of capital stock levels. So how do you find them? Well, we typically do this, right? So we can use the first order condition with respect to C and the envelope condition, right? And then we have the constraint, uh, lambda K alpha equals uh, KT plus one CT. So we can use these conditions to solve for the steady state, okay? So typically we can find these numbers, okay? Once you have the steady state, you can do this. Okay, I'm gonna look at, uh, these boundaries okay so k min will be that and k max will be that okay so 95 percent lower and 95 percent higher than the steady state all right so then you have a number k min right because you can calculate it and the number k max. And this is a closed and bounded set uh, in the real line. Okay, so it's a subset of the real line, right? Now you can create the grid. Okay, you can have a particular, uh, let's say, distance d. So this will be uh, typically a small number, such as this one. Okay, then this, this will be the space uh, between different K values, all right? So then uh, forget about this, right? There will be a very large number between K min and K max, but it will all be discrete, okay? very large number of K points. Now you can denote this set by, by K. Now be careful, this set is finite and countable, okay? So a computer can understand what to do with it. All right, so that's the first step. Then remember what we did with the value function iteration. In value function iteration, remember step one, I told you that we set a guess, right? Now I wrote previously in the analytical case, I wrote this, right? Now that will be still true, but now for each K, what I mean is each K in this set. Okay, so then what do you have? Well, you have something like this. You have the Bellman equation, you want to maximize it. And in the first step, you have all these zeros, right? So then uh, you can try to understand, of course, you can start with this steady state as well, right? Because uh, yes, so, okay, I, I'm gonna back to that point. I'm gonna be back to that point, but let me show you this. So in, if you know the steady state, you can calculate V star, right? This is very simple. If there is a steady state, then the steady state value satisfies this, okay? Of course, we also assume that you know beta, then you know C star and alpha, etc. Then you can you can actually start with V star as well. Okay. Then what's the choice? The choice is gonna reflect this, right? So KT plus one plus CT must be equal to this, right? So you can, of course, uh, there is this constraint. There is this constraint and there is this constraint and there is this constraint, okay? Now you can calculate 
for each C, so remember, we are looking for a C that maximizes this, right? So then you can look for each case, each continuation value, right? You can look for a particular C. And those Cs, uh, there is a nice way to tell the computer that Cs cannot be uh, negative, uh, all right? So it's, it's pretty simple. But then at the end, for each possible value, you're gonna find a consumption level that maximizes uh, value function. So this will be again like this. So so this will be like this. In the first step, in the first step, v zero k. Remember, you have the grid now. Okay. It is not continuous. You have the grid. And you assume that all of them are equal to the uh, V star. Okay? So all of them were equal to the V star. Then you're going to find uh, your policy function, let's say, okay? And the policy function will give you, again, for the for all these Ks, what is the maximizing consumption level, okay? Then you find, let's say, uh, let's say it's also uh, a constant, all right? But in the next step, you're going to be closer to the truth. So you're going to be, you're going to have something like this. Okay, and you're gonna have something like this, for instance. But this is still not true. So in the second step, you're gonna have something like this. Okay. So this will continue until you will have an approximation like this and you will have an approximation like this. Okay, so for each K in your space, state space, you're gonna have an approximation. And if you, if you, of course, uh, have like a finer and finer and finer gray, uh, grid, okay, that approximation gets better, but it takes more time. Okay. Uh, you can get finer uh, grid or coarser grid. Okay. So that depends on time, that depends on your uh, constraint. But eventually, since, I mean, if the problem satisfies the contraction mapping property, then it would converge, all right? And here in our problem, of course, we satisfy all the constraints. This is uh, strictly concave. Uh, this is strictly concave. They are both continuously differentiable, etc. There is monotone, monotonicity. Uh, uh, there are other nice properties such as uh, this set, is compact uh, and this set is compact. So, so everything is nice here in this problem, obviously. Okay. Uh, one thing that we do not satisfy for some of the theorems, as I said before, is that this function is unbounded, but it is not a big problem here because uh, these sets are compact. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's look at how this works. Let me open MATLAB. If you have any questions, you can now ask them. Let me just find the code. 
and we can run it. Uh, okay, where are you? I think that's the one that works. Uh, So, just a sec, let me, I think this is the one I wrote for my class, like a century ago or something. share my screen just a sec uh, so okay let me share my full screen so you can see everything all right so this is the code so i think this is uh, uh, assignment two at some point problem three part two i guess and this is a deterministic model there. There's a stochastic version as, as well. So this is a MATLAB code, MATLAB script. Um, you don't have to understand all of this for now. Uh, I mean, it's if, if you are interested in computer computation and you know dynamic macro and other stuff, it's better, of course, you can learn it. I mean, you, you should learn something like this, either MATLAB or uh, Python, I don't know which one, but if, you are, if you're going to compute something, you need something like this. So this, uh, this is a time clock. So this is, this is, this is a clock. All right. So uh, it starts uh, when, when I input this command here. So it starts uh, keeping track of time. So these are parameters, alpha, beta, and lambda. All right. And these are the steady state values. So you can find these steady state values quite easily um, using the envelope condition, the first of the conditions and the constraint. Uh, basically, these are the steady state values. Now, these are lower bounds and upper bounds, All right? Remember, I want to create a grid here. SS means steady state, All right? This means steady state. So now I want to create this grid. As I said, I'm looking at 95% lower and 95% higher levels than steady state. Okay. And my increment, my my my, uh, you know, the space between each point is 0 0.001. Okay. So this is the command that creates this vector. Okay, so this is this this creates a vector. Then I uh, make it a column vector. So this is transpose basically. Okay, and um, this is the size of the vector. Okay, and now I create an initial value function. So the initial value function will be equal to steady state, right? But it will be it will be calculated for okay. Now let me run this part. Let me run this part of the code and show you the results. That's not the whole thing. But I have my alpha, beta. Do you see? Do you see all this, right? Guys, girls. Yes, we can see that. All right, great. So here, as you see, these are the inputs that I just give so v steady state is 1.6 uh, and this is the value function okay my, my k is now my the, the length of my grid is around 1000 okay so these are my k1 k2 values okay as you see they are increasing starting from a minimum and going to the maximum all right so steady state capital stock is what? 0.5. Uh, 
and value function levels at the initial guess, it's all equal to steady state value, as you see, right? So for each K, I have that. Then, what do I have? Then I have an empty policy function. So PF is for policy function, okay? Then I have my initial iteration, it is zero, and some, some uh, tall level. And maximum iteration size is 2000, all right? Now I, I start my loop, okay? That it will be a loop, right? Remember, step by step. So that that uh, that loop will work until convergence. So what do I want? I want this to work. I want this to work if uh, if tall is greater than this number. Okay, this is my epsilon. 10 to the minus six. And I want this to continue if the number of it, so this is my little j, all right, iter, and this is my big j, maximum number of iterations, 2000. So I want what is below this to continue, so this is a while condition, right, uh, until the convergence, because I want tolerance to be, uh, less than epsilon and I want iteration to be achieved before I hit the maximum. Then I create an empty value function. You see, this is, this is an empty value function, V new, okay? Then I look at K. So this is the production function, okay? And this is KT plus one. So here I am calculating consumption values if my state is uh, Ki, and I am doing, doing this for each and every Kt plus one, okay? Because K is a vector, I'm choosing a particular value, so so this is for the first step. This is for the first element in my grid. For the first element in my grid, if I am in that state, what could happen to my consumption? There could be uh, around 900 something consumption levels, depending on what you leave for the saving. Then some of these, of course, will be negative, right? Sorry, gonna... We have less than one minute. Okay, all right, so let me, let me now take a break. So it is 2.30. Let's meet.